World War II is kind of like a blank spot in national park history here in the United States. With so many other World War II stories to be told, it can be easy to overlook the vital and frankly astonishingly wide-ranging role that national parks played in the United States war effort. It's a chapter of national park history that we simply don't hear a lot about, and yet it's a chapter that slots right into the overall story of national parks in America. At a time when the world was embroiled in the deadliest conflict in its history, when every facet of American society was geared towards supporting the war effort, national parks were, in many ways, fighting for their very existence. Wars require resources, timber, animal products, water, raw materials, people. That familiar refrain we often talk about when it comes to national parks, the duality of balancing resource preservation with human use rears its head once again. Except this time, we are not talking about visitors and cars and campgrounds. We're talking about soldiers and tanks and training facilities. Obviously, the National Park Service made it out the other side of this conflict, but that outcome was not predetermined. And today, I want to share with you the impact that World War II had on the National Park Service here in America. Hello and welcome to National Park Diaries. My name is Cameron and this is a channel dedicated entirely to telling stories, just like this one, from the world's protected places. If you're interested in hearing more of those types of stories, consider liking, subscribing, and hitting the little bell thing so you don't miss an episode. That will also help these stories reach more people, which is basically all I'm trying to do here. Uh, I have a Patreon as well if you are feeling extra generous, this channel is entirely fan funded and your support does go a long way to helping me keep this entire production running. That's patreon.com slash National Park Diaries. Now, to clarify here, with this story, I'm not going to be covering parks that have been dedicated after World War II, parks that commemorate or interpret its history in some way. Parks like War in the Pacific National Historical Park in Guam, or Rosie the Riveter National Historical Park in California, or the World War II Memorial in DC, or the two Japanese internment camps that the Park Service oversees. Those are stories worth telling, but for this video, Video, this one right here, I want to examine the impact that World War II had on national park sites that already existed when the U.S. entered the war. So let's start with some broad level, system-wide facts and figures that will help us understand that impact. I think the most telling stat we can examine has to do with visitation. In 1941, when the U.S. entered the war in December, national parks saw more than 19 million visitors. By 1944, that number was 7 million. Most telling though, is that of those 7 million, between one third and one half of those visitors were military personnel. That's right, during World War II, up to half of national park visitation was from the military. A lot of this is just due to the rubber and gasoline rationing that U.S. citizens faced during the war, and when you consider that by this time, private automobiles were one of the major ways people were visiting national parks, it's no surprise that visitation numbers plummeted. Those resources simply weren't available for people to use on national park vacations. Similarly, the National Park Service also took a big hit in the budget department at this time, and by extension with staffing. Before the war, the National Park Service employed roughly 6,500 people and had a budget of about $30 million. By the end of the war, the National Park Service employed only 1,500 people and had a budget of less than $5 million an 84% decline. Some park workers were drafted, others enlisted voluntarily, and still others were let go. You can imagine the impact that reduced staffing and budgeting had on the Park Service's ability to manage the existing system, which had ballooned to 164 different units by this time. 
no rangers meant no ranger patrols, so the parks saw a major increase in illegal poaching during this time. There was an instance where the Morning Glory Pool in Yellowstone National Park exploded because so many people had thrown things in it that it became clogged. This was blamed on the fact that due to staffing shortages, no ranger was around to supervise these visitors. Finally, at Glacier Bay, then a national monument, the Navy decided to build a shipping and logistics base. It was deemed that they needed $15 million worth of trees to construct a pier, but because there wasn't a single ranger on duty at the monument to supervise these efforts, logging crews ended up cutting a virgin stand of timber within the monument's boundaries. These sorts of stories abound in the national parks throughout the war, and they give us an idea of the sorts of challenges the system faced with a bare-bones administrative apparatus. There simply wasn't enough money to adequately protect these places, and sacrifices had to, unfortunately, be made. And I think this is a good place to introduce Newton B. Drury, the MPS director during World War II. He had a tough job, as you can imagine. Like basically every other American citizen, he was trying to do his job to support the war effort. But as director of the National Park Service, which was only like 25 years old at this time, he also had an obligation to preserve the natural resources that national parks were created to protect in the first place. Those same resources that were now being eyed for extraction. It was an ever complicated balancing act. So Drury and other Park Service leadership came up with this sort of wartime game plan, right? They wanted to sort of pivot the messaging around national parks to frame it in some way where they could still be useful to the war effort, but not have their resources irreparably damaged to the point where post-war national parks basically wouldn't even exist. If that happened, it would be an existential threat to the national park system itself. So the message was basically that national parks were the protectors of America's natural and cultural heritage. As protectors of that heritage, national parks had an obligation to see that heritage survive through the end of the war. They maintained throughout the war that the best use of NPS resources was not in a consumptive or extractive capacity, but in a recreational and conservation one. Here, let me read you this quote from Drury on this philosophy. He said, quote, the needless sacrifice of this scenic and cultural heritage during the war would deprive the American people of some of the most potent symbols of their national greatness, pride and love of country, end quote. One of the things I've always appreciated about the Park Service is how forward thinking some of their leadership has been. This was no different during World War II, as leaders realized how important it was to have these places to come back to once the war was over. They could also point to this philosophy when all of the extraction people and war profiteers were like accusing them of not doing their part. Their argument was they were doing their part, just in a different way, not the way the profiteers wanted them to. So that's like the overall philosophy, right? That parks don't have to be extracted from to be helpful to the war effort. To implement this message though, to enact this game plan and see that parks weren't destroyed, Drury and other park leaders basically opened up national parks to the military in other ways. This included allowing national parks to be used as training grounds. If you've seen my video on White Sands, it's probably not all that surprising. I won't elaborate on that one just because I do have a video already covering it, but there were plenty of other parks where this was the case as well. Mount Rainier National Park was chosen as an ideal location for winter combat training because of its ability to simulate an alpine environment even during the summer. The first ever U.S. military ski troops started their training here before moving to Camp Hale in Colorado, now a national monument under Forest Service protection, and they used the harsh winter conditions on the mountain to test out winter equipment and clothing. Denali had a similar arrangement as well. For desert warfare training, there were a couple of instances where Grand Canyon was used, but from what I can tell, today's Mojave National Preserve was actually much more helpful in that regard, but it wasn't under National Park Service protection at the time, so I'm not going to cover it in this video. 
It wasn't just infantry being trained in national parks at this time either, though. They trained literal spies in national parks as well. Yeah, the precursor to the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS, trained spies in the woods of Catoctin Mountain Park and Prince William Forest Park, both of which were under the Recreational Demonstration Area program at the time. Ideal candidates for these programs were best described as quote unquote a PhD who could win a bar fight. They were doing all sorts of covert training stuff here, including jumping people out of helicopters so they could simulate returning intelligence from behind enemy lines. It might surprise you to learn as well that several national park sites were used as POW camps during World War II. Yes, Gettysburg National Military Park had a temporary camp built for German prisoners of war. More than 500 prisoners came through the camp. They actually worked in the local agricultural industry and were paid $1 per hour, which they could use at the camp exchange. This camp did have its troubles, though. One prisoner hung himself while working at an apple orchard, two escaped and were on the run for eight days before being captured, and the whole camp went on strike several times. South of Gettysburg at Fort Hunt, part of George Washington Memorial Parkway, more German POWs were housed, except this was more of an interrogation facility, and according to one document, the techniques they used, quote, have since been considered the gold standard of interrogation techniques, end quote. I don't know what that means, and I don't want to find out. All along the coast as well, national parks were called in in the name of shoreline defense. Some parks just helped out with a program of aircraft detection where personnel were basically trained to spot and identify enemy aircraft. These parks included Acadia, the Statue of Liberty, Olympic, Denali, Joshua Tree, Mount Rainier, Lassen, Yosemite, and the Channel Islands. The Wright Brothers Memorial had submarine detection technology installed. Some parks had radio facilities installed and operated by the War Department like Acadia, Dry Tortugas, and Haleakala. The Park Service actually got pretty mad at the Haleakala one because they installed these giant 90-foot towers with like red flashing lights on them, which damaged the summit. Like they knocked a few feet of total elevation off the mountain because of how much work they had done. And there were so many towers it became known as Haleakala National Forest. There was also a bombing range at Hawaii Volcanoes in the Ka'u Desert, which the Army only used once. It was returned to the Park Service in 1945. Some coastal parks got taken over completely, though. Both Fort Pulaski National Monument in Georgia and Cabrillo National Monument in California were under total military control for the duration of the war effort. Fort Pulaski was used as a Navy base and Cabrillo was basically incorporated into the nearby Fort Rosecrans. In all, throughout the war, more than 9,000 acres of national park sites were transferred to the military during the war. But not all national park occupations were for training or combat purposes. Remember how I said that a lot of visitation to the national parks during the war was from military personnel? Well, in a lot of cases, national parks had agreements with the military for soldiers to visit and be able to take in the beautiful national park scenery completely free of charge. The Park Service even sent out maps detailing every state and national park in America which could be distributed to troops so they knew where nearby recreation facilities were, depending on where they were stationed. Sometimes camps were even established to house large amounts of soldiers on leave so they could relax and pursue recreational opportunities while not in combat. Over the course of the war, 33 of these were built in national parks capable of housing 20,000 soldiers. Denali had one of these, for example, for soldiers on leave from the Aleutian Islands. Alaska had actually been completely closed off for tourist travel because of its strategic value and vulnerable defenses, so visitation to Denali had dropped to basically nothing. This camp helped sustain that park during the war. In Yosemite, and perhaps the most famous example of national park occupation during the war, the Iwani Hotel was converted into a military convalescent hospital. Nearly 7,000 patients went through its doors during the war, and it actually became a very valuable learning experience for the Navy. See, they initially opened up the hospital as a psychiatric recovery facility for sailors with PTSD and trauma-related conditions, hoping the quiet, calm environs of the Yosemite Valley would help them heal. What they discovered, though, was that 
sailors found the valley claustrophobic, actually, and the lack of regular social interaction actually inhibited their ability to heal. As a result, the facility was redone to provide more of a normal social experience and help sailors feel like they were returning to everyday life. So families were allowed to come visit, lots of recreational facilities were added, a library, a band, USO performances, things like that. The Park Service also offered guided hikes and interpretation as well. So again, you can see how wide-ranging the National Park Service involvement was during World War II. Various units were either used or leased by the military in some way, encompassing a wide range of activities and disciplines. It was like a dance, a push and pull to support the war effort and accommodate the military, but to also stick to the core mission of the National Park Service in terms of resource preservation. Remember, this was the Park Service's plan to mitigate the worst impacts of the war effort on national parks while still supporting that effort in some way. But that didn't mean that there weren't impacts. I already mentioned that wars require resources. We already talked about gasoline and rubber, but yeah, things like timber, water, meat, raw materials, they're all necessary. At one point, the Park Service received a request to melt down Civil War cannons for scrap metal. They declined. These are the types of things you need to fight a war, and some of these things just happened to be available in national parks. So the National Park Service was always fielding requests for resource extraction within park boundaries. Take logging, for instance. Olympic was a big target for this. It was home to a lot of Sitka spruce, which was the favored lumber for aircraft construction at the time. Because it had lots of Sitka spruce, the request eventually came in to log it for the war effort. The Park Service really didn't want to allow this in park boundaries, and so they had to make a kind of compromise. They allowed the harvest of 3 million board feet of Sitka spruce in an area known as the Queets Corridor. It wasn't technically in the park boundary at the time, but they kind of wanted it to be eventually, and so it was still a bit of a letdown to have it be logged. But it wasn't in the main area of Olympic National Park, and that was the goal. It was yet another trade-off for the war effort. Similar requests came into log in Great Smoky Mountains and Shenandoah National Parks, but these requests were shut down completely. The Park Service did allow some logging of dead and downed trees along the roadside of the Blue Ridge Parkway, however. Or take grazing. This was a big issue during World War I as well. Horace Albright fought off a lot of those requests during that war when he was acting Park Service Director. The Park Service resisted these requests again during World War II, although some grazing was allowed in national parks during the war. 43 different park sites saw 1.3 million acres grazed. And thus, we find ourselves right back at that familiar theme, one which always seems to creep into these videos somehow how to balance the needs of humans in national parks with the preservation of resources in those parks. Normally, I'd talk about this with visitor infrastructure and park development, but during World War II, we see a different variation on this theme. This time, parks had to accommodate the needs of a military fighting in the largest conflict the world had ever seen. There were ups and downs, pushes and pulls, wins and losses, yes, but in a lot of ways, this was par for the course for national parks. For their entire existence, including to this day still, they've been threading that needle, making compromises, and looking at the impacts that World War II had on the national park system, I think is a really helpful way to analyze that eternal struggle, to see it from a different angle, yet realizing you're still looking at the same thing. All right, that was a big one, a fun one. Uh, this was already a pretty long video, and I had to cut out a bunch of stuff out of it, unfortunately. Uh, all my sources are in the description if you want to see some of the stuff that didn't make it in. Uh, a reminder to like, subscribe, hit the little bell thing, check out my Patreon, and follow me on Instagram for channel updates and park adventures, and it's really the best place to get in touch with me if you want to. Um, also, just a heads up, I will not have a video out next week, unfortunately. I've got a super mega giant three-week trip coming up to Montana and Alaska, 
and I need some time to pre-make some videos for you all while I'm gone. Uh, so that's what next week is for. Also, also, if you are interested in a meetup while I'm out on this trip, check out my community tab for dates and locations. This will be the first time I'm trying to organize something like this, and a few of you have requested it, so there's probably going to be a bit of a learning curve, but I'd love to meet some of you if you're in the areas I will be visiting. Uh, again, check out my community tab for more info. All right, that's everything I have. See you in two weeks. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.